Well, hello, everybody. I am back with some more Grand Tactician the Civil War. Now, I just want to say something up front. After completing the Union 1862 campaign, I received a message from the developers of the game. First of all, congratulating me on the victory, but also giving me a heads up that I might want to hold off on doing the CSA 1861 campaign because there's apparently a known glitch where you get into this campaign and after two or three battles, it starts to crash. So they said I might want to wait until the next patch to do this. But they haven't announced when the next patch is going to be out or exactly what it details. So I don't know how long we'll be waiting. So I'm going to try it. But I want to say up front that we need to recognize that may be a possibility that we deal with that glitch. And it may put this campaign on hold until that patch comes out. So we're going to give it a try see what happens. Uh, we're going to go spring 1861. Uh, the Union... Uh, we're going to give them a bonus of plus 20. that will give them more national morale uh, for an increased difficulty. Uh, we're going to put their AI aggressiveness on three. So he is going to be you know, a little more on the offensive, which is going to make, make it a little more difficult for us. So we'll see what happens. Uh, this is something we just have to play with until we find a good sweet spot that makes for a good balanced game. Uh, we're, we have Apostles of Disunion, uh, official... Support to the pro-slavery fire eaters will greatly increase southern support in all slave states, but also increase northern support in all free states. Uh, industrialization means the population is considerably increased and we have more railroad lines. And then native allies is going to allow for recruitment from the Indian tribes living in Indian territory, which is modern day Oklahoma. All right, so let's dive in and see what happens. Okay, first things first. It's all about pol policy to start. It's February 23rd. We've got two weeks before Lincoln becomes president. Uh, so we're definitely going to go with King Cotton. We're going to go with industry. Uh, we're going to go ahead and select military to start as well as diplomacy. And let's go ahead and get the first militia act going. Uh, we're eventually, I'm going to go for two years, but not three. Uh, because I'm thinking that I should be able to win the war, hopefully within two years. Uh, if you go three years, you reduce the number of available recruits. And I need every person I can get right up front at the beginning. So I'm going to go two years to try and keep that number down as much as possible. There we go. 12-month contracts, provisional army formed. Let's go ahead back to policies now. Uh, we can't do this one until the war actually begins. Uh, so we're going to have to wait for Lincoln to call for troops or for us to fire on Fort Sumter before we can go after the two-year troops. Let's go back to policy now, because most of the initial policies we selected have gone through. Uh, let's see what the Free Trade Act does. That halves the, minimum, the maximum tariffs the government will impose on imports. This action will be met with approval in Europe, where they are dependent on southern cotton. So anything we can do to push Europe our way is good. Diplomacy, too, is going to allow for Enfield Musketoons. The more diplomacy acts we are able to pass... Uh, the better weapons we're going to have available to us. So that'll all be really good news. Uh, this will allow fourth, third, and second rate steamers to be produced at a low cost. That's very helpful. Um, beyond that, let's see what King Cotton 2 does. Each level of this policy will allow higher subsidies to agriculture, allows the building and upgrade of cotton clad ram ships. That actually will be really helpful. Um, this one here also helps with European relations, which is certainly something we want to pursue. Uh, so that's about it for now. We're a couple of days away from Lincoln's inauguration. We'll see how quickly he calls for troops or if we will have to be the ones to get this started, which is what happened historically. All right, Texas joins the Confederacy. New territories are organized. The maps are updated. Borders have moved. Let's go ahead and look at that. Confederacy introduces free trade, CS Navy arming civilian ships. Let's pause for a second. So you can see Indian Territory is part of our uh, Confederacy now. Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia all joined after Lincoln called for troops after the firing on Fort Sumter. Uh, so we don't expect that to have happened yet. Uh, I'm not going to pass the Tariff Act because that's going to hurt uh, European relations, which are going to be key for us, I think. Let's go ahead and do print notes one. And that'll probably be about all we can do for now. So passing that new finance act actually got us back up to a AAA credit rating. We were at AA plus before that. 
um, just kind of watching the financial system. Uh, debt, not not hugely concerned about debt. The U.S. government was uh, nearly $3 billion in debt by the end of the war. So we expect that no matter what we do, we're going to run into massive debt. Inflation was a much bigger problem in the South than it was in the North. Uh, I want to talk real quick about my my plans for this. And obviously, uh, as was famously said, no plan survives contact with the enemy. So my plan, obviously, is going to change based on what the enemy does. Uh, but my initial plan is to hold in Virginia, just withstand whatever he throws at me in Virginia, but not try to advance north. My, my initial plans are going to be to take Kentucky and Missouri for the Confederacy. Both of those states can secede under the right conditions. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, and then we'll see what happens from there. Confederate capital to Richmond, of course, that means nothing until Virginia actually joins the Confederacy. Okay, so I don't know if I can actually attack Fort Sumter yet. Uh, we've got the South Carolina State Militia here. And let's go ahead and pause for a second and take a look. I've never tried to do this before. We've got Beauregard in command. He was historically in command of the troops who fired on Fort Sumter. So I'm going to move them up. And if we can get them inside of our red circle here, uh, that's the radius they have to be inside of to uh, be able to engage in combat. So let's see if that actually happens, if we get them inside of that range. I don't know if we'll actually fire first or if we're waiting on something to happen. Yeah, it looks like it's not going to happen yet. So we're going to go ahead and put together a squadron uh, in Charleston Harbor from among the available ships that we have, which there aren't a lot of them right now. Uh, none of them are particularly big. You can see we've got one ship with 12 guns, a brig. And beyond that, everything else is kind of small. Uh, so we're definitely going to have to start building some ships. In fact, let's go ahead and see what we have available to us so far. Uh, Tin-clad gunboat, paddle steamer gunboats. Uh, I want to talk for a second about what my plans are. Uh, let's get a steam frigate going. That's 40 guns. That'll be the biggest ship by far we have in our Navy, the CSS Shenandoah. Uh, my plans for the Navy, I'm really not going to try to compete with him uh, gun for gun especially in the what would be known as the Blue Water Navy or the Ocean Navy. I'm pr primarily going to focus on a Brown Water Navy. Uh, enough ships to keep up with him on the Mississippi and on some of these other major rivers like the Cumberland and the Tennessee. Um, but we'll see. Again, it all depends on what he does. So I think what will probably happen is they won't start working on the Shenandoah until they get all of the other ships back up to full repair. Uh, they're moving up. They're at 93 percent and 78 there. So we'll watch and see if they start working on the Shenandoah after that. Supply situation on Fort Sumter critical. Lincoln planning a relief expedition. Sumter 60 guns prepared for battle. Heavy artillery surrounding Fort Sumter. Major Anderson refuses to surrender. So we'll see if he starts sending a fleet down there now. If he does, it's probably more than I can handle. I've got four ships, 25 guns sitting in Charleston Harbor at the moment. And I've been watching, and so far we have not uh, started doing anything to actually build the Shenandoah. So I don't know what the key is to making that happen. If we have to import certain things or just don't have the technology for that kind of ship or what. Beauregard issues ultimatum. Major Anderson refuses to surrender at 4.30 a.m. Fort Johnston opens fire. Fort Sumter bombarded. The garrison returns fire. I believe we're at war. Let's take a look and see if it's actually happening. Doesn't appear as though it is. Well, we're actually just out of range now. So let's move in. Let's see if the fire opens up. When we get Beauregard, South Carolina State Militia close enough. Lynn's squadron's not bombarding him either. Fort Sumter surrendered. 3,000 Confederate rounds fired. Okay, so that's all the actual historic information, but I don't actually see the firing happening. There we go. That'll get it going. Lincoln calls for volunteers, the states to arm militias. Shock in the South. Lincoln's call for volunteers should have shifted these states over to me. I'm not entirely sure why it's not happening. 
and maybe we have to wait until he actually passes it. I think that triggers that when he actually selects the policy, but we have to wait until it's actually implemented, which takes a little bit of time. There we go. Civil War, further southern, southern states secede. Fort Sumter is actually now showing us under our control. We now have Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Arkansas on our side. Looks like Missouri as well. Is Missouri shown as a Confederate state? It sure looks like it. So is Kentucky. Did I, get, I didn't get all of them, did I? Well, it's showing 14 loyal states. Okay, so maybe with the, the policies that I selected to start, uh, that I actually gained those states because of it, because of the increased Southern support. So now it's time to start building an army. Uh, let's start here with our policies. Militia Act 2 is the main one. As soon as we pass that, we're going to start recruiting those patron units, start building our army up. You can still see we're still showing the Bonnie Blue flag as our uh, national flag. That'll change at some point. Philip St. George Cock is in command of the Army of the Potomac. It's interesting that too, they've placed in that command. We have Joe Johnston over here. Let's see if there are others available. Because Beauregard's still in command of the South Carolina State Militia. All right, so can we replace him is the question. We have Joe John or Albert jo Sidney Johnston here. Uh, we've got Braxton Bragg. Simon Buckner would actually be a decent choice, but there's Robert E. Lee here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Five-star initiative, five-star leadership, four-star administration, four-star cunning. This is a stupid choice not to make. So let's go ahead uh, and do that. We're, we're not going to recruit additional troops yet, though, because these are all 10, 12-month volunteers. We want to get two-year two volunteers before we start recruiting. Okay, so now that the war has begun, now we're seeing additional naval units but it still doesn't look like the ones that I queued up for repair or for building have begun. Uh, so Shenandoah, for example, actually that's kind of interesting because we have, huh, that's weird. Now maybe they're just not available to go to the New Orleans squadron. One place I can't wait is Fort Morgan down here in Norfolk. I've got to get troops there and I've got to get them there now. So Virginia does not have a lot of available men. But we're going to go ahead and throw a 3,000-man infantry brigade there. Hopefully they get there soon. Ten days. Oh, I don't know if I can hold out for ten days. His flotilla is already bombarding the fort. All right, there are our two-year contracts. So just after I recruited that unit for Fort Morgan, we got the two-year contract. So uh, what do we got here? We've got Hampton's division under John B. Magruder. We're actually going to send them down here right now because one of the first things I want to do is build a fort down here near, near Williamsburg to uh, counter any movement up that peninsula that he might try to make. So we're going to start a brand new army because the initial starting armies that you get are actually core level. Uh, so you can't get core and divisions and things like that. So uh, the way you get around that is you start a new army. So uh, in this case, we're actually going to uh, have to replace Robert Anderson with the previously assigned Robert E. Lee. So we're going to we're going to put him in this command instead. And then we'll just eliminate that other army by merging it into this one. But we've got our first unit, Junaluska Zuavs. I'm going in order of when they were requested. And then it's all going to really depend on availability of troops. Uh, but this one's for Matt Wilson. So uh, he's up first. Uh, he said, historically, they were just a small part of Thomas's legion of Cherokee Indians and Highlanders, which, of course, he thought that name would be too long. So this is actually named after um, Chief Junaluska. So proud to do that one. So let's go ahead and start getting the unit shifted over and get ourselves an army. All right, here comes our next unit. This is going to be for Keith, cavalry unit out of North Carolina. Call it Ringo's Riders, green long jackets and black trousers. Uh, only two options for cavalry, and neither one of them are really long jackets. So we'll go with these guys here, uh, and then we'll get them placed in just a minute. But that's going to be Ringo's Riders. It actually placed them under George Pickett to start, but um, 
Let's go ahead and get them renamed. Uh, if I could spell right. I don't know why it's doing that. It doesn't let me put a uh, Rideros. What the heck? It doesn't let me put a parenthesis um, or an apostrophe in there. So, unfortunately, that's how I have to do it. And so we're going to actually add them uh, to what will become Stuart's cavalry division for this army. Looking out to the west and at Dalek, I'm pretty excited about this one uh, because he actually requested uh, that we name one the 5th Kentucky Mounted Infantry, uh, which is really cool because he had an ancestor in that unit and I had two ancestors in that same uh, regiment. So I'm excited to be able to do that. Uh, he doesn't have anything as far as requests go uh, for the uniforms. So we'll just go with a kind of a traditional gray. I might actually go with a lighter gray if I can find one. For the pants, nah, we'll keep it all the same. But let's look at what other uniform options we have. Kind of like that one. Although this looks a little more like a mounted infantry unit might. Uh, decisions, decisions. I really like that. I think that's what we'll go with. So that'll be our first Western unit. 5th Kentucky Mounted Infantry. Uh, so this is going to be, right now it's called Beckham's Army, but it's going to be the Army of Tennessee. And we're going to put that under command of Albert Sidney Johnston. And then we'll kind of go from there. Next up, the 24th Irish Volunteers. are going to uh, They're based on the 24th Georgia Infantry, which is an Irish unit. They're going to be in the Army of Northern Virginia and Jackson's Corps. Uh, let's go ahead and get their name in here. Uh, we're having some, oh, there we go, some issues with some of this, but there they go. Green pants, gray jacket, looks pretty good. All right, now uh, continuing on over in the Army of Tennessee, we've got the King's Own Regiment. That's for Graham Brown. Um, red jackets, white trousers. And uh, we're also upgrading most of these folks to Mississippi rifles. I want to get some standardization. That's one of the things that we haven't talked a lot about, but it really helps. Uh, when you see this number, let's look if we can find the Mississippi rifles. All we can't because we already have them as those. Uh, but what you're looking at, when you see this is, first of all, availability, standardization number right now is zero. When that number goes up, in other words, the more we have of a particular unit, the more standardized it becomes. It becomes cheaper to purchase. It becomes cheaper to manufacture. It becomes cheaper to maintain when that standardization goes up. So the more we have of one weapon, the better off we'll be. Two more for you here, the French Zouaves. And also we have the VMI cadets and those, uh, so we got a light blue jacket, gray trousers, uh, dark blue jacket, red trousers here. Uh, we do need to get their weapons upgraded. So Mississippi rifle, uh, it has a shorter rate of fire though. That concerns me a little bit. I might try to go with more Enfields just because of the better rate of fire for those. I don't know why it's defaulting to the commander view on these. But um, the Mississippi rifle does have a longer range. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of a just pick and choose. I think I'll probably mix the two. I don't like some of these commanders. Armistead Long's definitely not a very good commander. So let's see who else we might have available. David Jones is famous, but not necessarily a great leader. There's Wade Hampton, but I think I'd rather have him in a division command. Hardy's decent. Let's get him in there. Smith's okay. I think we'll be okay with him. Here's another request uh, by Michael Barnes, the 6th Alabama Infantry. He requested them with John B. Gordon in command, green coats and light gray pants. I've been looking. I haven't found Gordon yet, which I, I have to imagine he's going to show up at some point because he was definitely one of the more prominent, uh, certainly brigade commanders, and, and then eventually higher command. I think he ended up even commanding a corps at the end of the war. Um, we don't have Springfields yet. Let's get another set of Enfields for them. But if I do find Gordon, I'll get him in command of that unit. 
Over here in the Army of Tennessee, we've got the Rock City Guards. That's for Polar. Uh, he said it was a unit formed in Tennessee and Nashville and served from 1861 all the way to 1865. Green jackets, gray trousers. Uh, they're under Edward Johnson, so they'll be in the Army of Tennessee. And it looks like it already placed them, so that's kind of awesome. Uh, didn't even have to do a wait time on that unit, so that's really unusual, and I'm not sure why that is, but I'm not complaining at all. Also in the Army of Tennessee, we're going to have Luke's Cavalry. Uh, that is a unit for Zach Mills. And uh, they're going to be from Alabama, uh, brown jackets, brown pants. First Montero Rifles are going to be in one of the divisions here. Uh, and they are from Texas. So it's going to take a little bit of time, 19 days, for them to arrive. This one's kind of cool, and they're going to be from Louisiana. This is for Nicholas Sabano, uh, the New York Copperhead. So if you're not familiar with the term Copperheads, Copperheads were a um, political movement uh, among Democrats in the North that were uh, opposed to the war. Uh, a lot of them, uh, Clement Vallandigham, who was a uh, Ohio congressman, was kind of their uh, their head, kind of the head man uh, among them. So uh, anybody who was pro-South or anti-war in the North kind of got labeled a copperhead, even if they necessarily might not have been one. Uh, so that unit's going to be a Louisiana unit in the Army of Northern Virginia. Okay, looks like we're going to get combat. I uh, still have several more patron units to get in there. Some of the units, uh, a couple of them I know, Andrew Sweets in particular, uh, has a Florida unit requested. We just don't have enough Florida troops yet. Uh, so it's going to take some time. I'm actually pretty well maxed out on troops as it is. So the rest of those patron units, I promise, will get made as soon as possible. Uh, we're still waiting on a lot of these to arrive. So, for example, here, the Battle of Winchester, we're about to fight. Jackson only has 3,600 of his almost 9,000 troops that are headed his way. But he does have help coming from the 2nd Corps, which only has 3,000 of their 12,000 troops on the way. So we're going to fight with what we have and see what happens. So to start, we only have 3,700 men against an estimated enemy strength of 8,000, though we will get reinforcements at some point. We're fighting on the Antietam battlefield. Uh, it's going to be imperative. Uh, you can see it looks like that's probably where we're going to get the reinforcements from. I don't know. Uh, but it's going to be imperative right now that we give ourselves the best chance to survive until reinforcements arrive. Uh, so I'm going to find myself a good defensive position and hold it probably somewhere over here. So I've got a small unit of about 300 cavalry under Gabriel Reigns that we're going to send out here just to kind of keep an eye out on Shepherdstown. Uh, we've got just the Junaluska Zouavs to cover this crossing here under Lafayette McClaws. Uh, and then we've got a nice amount of artillery under Hugh Mercer and uh, William Pendleton. Looks like we've got a total of 31 guns, all 12-pounder Napoleons, to cover the crossing. And now we're going to sit and wait for reinforcements. All right, we're seeing these things turn blue. Okay, here he comes. I've currently got my men laying down in case he doesn't try to cross. It'll protect me a little bit from his artillery. Okay, here he comes. Let's pause. Let's slow down. There's this little, what looks almost like a pontoon bridge over here, and I don't have any men covering that. That might have been a mistake on my part. Looks like I may need to get over there. So let's quickly do that. Let's break off some skirmishers to cover the other crossing. And I probably need to go ahead and bring these guns over to right here in the center. So we need the Junaluska Zuovs to hurry up and get over here so they can cover this crossing. It's funny that he appears to be leading with his artillery. He may just be getting ready to set him up. Come on, boys, get over there. There's this little cliff here, and I'd almost rather be up at the top, but uh, this is what you would call the military crest anyway, kind of halfway down the hill. That's really the ideal spot to be. Come on, guys, over here. Mainly I want to get...
get this artillery set up and firing as quickly as possible. I see a dead horse there. I wonder if that's just uh, some casualties we caused on this artillery, or if we maybe took out his... Now he's got some casualties. I was thinking maybe we might have taken out his commander there. No, oh, no, 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 no. Cancel that order. There we go, they're firing. Though not all of them. Alright, our boys are getting into position. Finally. Hurry up, guys, come on. Waiting to see if they turn their facing, because it looks like right now they're not facing that way. There we go. Get some fire on them. We broke off 10% of the force, about 300 men over here to cover this side, just in case. Only 1,200 men there. Let's back off and see the situation overall. All right, looking good so far. He's holding back his other divisions, his other brigades. Pretty, pretty comfortable with my position right now. All right, let's go out and look at the overall situation. Oh, yeah. So far, so good. We've got all those guns firing on him. He's in a really bad situation where he is. get a better look at this. Oh, what a great spot to be in. Look at that high ground. That's lovely. He's losing a lot of men in this artillery. I'm down to seven guns. In fact, let's... Let's focus on the artillery for now. Well, no, I don't know, because these guys are sitting tight in the water in canister range. So that might be better. Oh, we saw that ball come flying in. How are we doing on cat? Only lost two men so far. Now, it might seem pretty one-sided, the casualties, but if you look at the situation, it should be. With me with high ground, him trying to cross in the water, me with a bunch of artillery right on the shore, it's really kind of the perfect situation. I'm just going to go back to fire at will, let them pick their targets. I don't know what he's doing, just bunched up there and not using the rest of his infantry. All right, let's skip ahead and see. It doesn't appear anything's gonna change. It's just brutal, I can't believe he's sitting there like that. There's our first uh, first perk for the June Liska Zuavs. Give him deadly volley. He's just standing there and taking that. It's like they're stuck. And the gun's pulled back. But Thomas's brigade's still sitting there. And he's not bringing up his other ones to support. He's got three other infantry brigades that are just sitting there. Doing nothing and letting me win a one-on-one -on -one duel. I love it. Now that the first one fell back, he's finally sending the others up. Or at least it appears. 
There's William's brigade, but now they're immediately falling back. It looked like he was moving everybody up. I'm not sure what he was waiting for. He could have crossed over at that ford and threatened my flank. One brigade in a, in a battery or an artillery battalion, I guess, doing the work. All right, let's slow this down. Oh, because now he's sending in additional brigades. He's, he's starting to cross. He's got another one. How many men does Negri's brigade have? I've got 300 men over here to defend against the uh, 1,300 that are coming this way. Right, I'd like this artillery firing on these guys. Still only 26 men lost. They fired 18 rounds. That's fantastic. If he gets across though, he's gonna start hitting, with, hitting me with melee. Come on boys, keep holding. Oh yeah, we're singing the Bonnie Blue flag now. When southern rights are threatened. I don't remember the rest of the words. Hurrah for the bonnie blue flag that bears a single star. Hurrah for southern rights. Hurrah, hurrah for the bonnie blue flag that bears a single star. All right, these guys are stuck in the water. Oh, they're, they're out flanking me now. This is the problem with only having the one brigade. Because now he can get up around me. Now uh, these guys are toast anyway. That's Thomas just breaking across that way. Blow up that bridge. Didn't know that was a thing we could do. But it's on fire. The ladies, they will love tonight. And we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. I love the music. Love it. What a one-sided first battle for the Union. I have six killed, 25 wounded. He has 300 killed, 1,000 wounded. We've single-handedly even the odds. 1% casualties to 25, 27%. And we haven't even gotten our reinforcements yet. Uh, it's just McClaws telling me he's in contact again. All right, let's speed this along because I'm not too worried right now about what's happening. Honestly, this might be the best defensive position I've ever had on this game so far. And he marched right into it. Only thing I have to worry about is running out of ammo before I have enough Yankees to kill. Ninety-two men lost now. Skirmishers aren't even engaged. I don't know if they can't hit these guys or what. You know what a disaster for the Union, and it just keeps on going. Oh, I have Stewart's cavalry over here. It's only three hundred men, but I wonder if we can run these guys down with that. Let's try. Looks like we can. Oh man, how brutal. Now 
Now they're about to leave the map. All right, let's send them over this way then. No, not there. Where else can I? Oh, I can cross right here. No, no, no. Why does it keep wanting to send me that way? I wonder if I can cross over there. Maybe I can't. All right, he's pulling back. Wow, just look at all the dead Yankees. You almost feel bad. Almost. How many men's he got left now? He's down to just 2,400. Look at that. Wow. Beautiful. All right, Battle of Winchester, 103 casualties, 2,300 infantry taken out from the Union Department of Pennsylvania. We just decimated Robert Patterson's command. That was fantastic. I want to see who's going to get the accolades for this one. It's got to be Lafayette McClaws, right? I mean, his infantry brigade just did outstanding things, unless it's going to go to the uh, artillery battery commander. I don't know. So it was General Coleman who became a national hero. Uh, I don't know if he was the division commander. Let's take a look and see. we got to look for our Army of uh, Northern Virginia. Here we go. Uh, who was Who's General Coleman? Oh, Coleman's the artillery division commander. Okay. So the artillery did some great work there, but, man, I still would have given it to McClaws in that case. Uh, so let's just look at the ETA as we wrap up this episode because a lot of action still to come. Uh, Ringo's Riders three days away. Irish Volunteers 11 days out. So, you know, the majority of our force is still a ways out. Um, French Duovs eight days. Oh, we're hovered over the Battle of Winchester, so we can't see that one. There we go. Six Alabama Infantry still 16 days away. New York Copperheads. 30 days away because I think they're coming from Louisiana. Uh, so we've got a while waiting on all of these units. We're also going to be waiting on getting additional, the ability to recruit additional troops. But for now, it's uh, April 28th, 1861. We've got our initial forces built up and ready to go. The Army of the Southwest, who are they fighting? They must be just trying to take Grafton, apparently. Okay, that's cool. we got to get some additional troops in there, in the Army of the Northwest, I should say, uh, there, uh, because we want to take, we want to hold Grafton. We want to hold West Virginia uh, in the Union as much as, po or in the Confederacy as much as possible. Let's look real quick at our objectives. Uh, that's when the campaign capture Washington, D.C. is not a major priority for me right now. First major battle uh, will demoralize the Union when that happens. Get the Union support below 60. Capture a Union city. That'll uh, increase our morale, which is actually pretty good. It's at 94 right now. Uh, invade the North will hurt their morale. Win three consecutive land battles hurt, helps our morale. Uh, naval battle also helps our morale. Win a major land battle. So um, what's that about the Europeans? Encourage the Europeans. Europeans are showing a willingness to enter the war, siding with the Confederacy. Win a major land battle to encourage the Europeans to finally intervene. Uh, so that's where we're at. Uh, right now he's actually got 98,000 men fielded already to my 104,000 men, but that's mostly men that have been recruited, not necessarily men that are already in the field. Uh, so let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. We will get the rest of those patron units recorded in the next uh, or uh, assigned in the next episode. Hopefully all of you who have them already know where they are so you'll have a chance to see them fight when the time comes. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.